thank God for the opportunity to be with you today as we rejoice in the God of our salvation. A little later on, I'm going to be speaking on this subject, don't quit. And that is very timely, by the way, for all of us. Don't quit. Let's just bow for prayer. Father, we come into your presence rejoicing in the God of our salvation. We thank you that you love us and that your grace is more than abundant for our needs. Help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And truly, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Bless every part of the service according to your plan and your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will stand and turn with me to number 11 in your hymnals, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, Tune my heart to sing Thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it Name of God's redeeming love Hitherto thy love has blessed me Thou hast brought me to place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger. Bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to praise how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a better, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Give the Lord a hand. going to go to the screen right now, and the first song we're going to sing is entitled, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Well, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb. Third verse. When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay 
aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Praise the Lord. There is no other name but Jesus, and his precious blood cleanses us from all sin. The next song, He Touched Me. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath the load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me And now I am no longer the same He touched me Oh, he touched me and all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I see. He touched me, and he made me whole. Since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made can sing the mighty power of God, which is the next song. Think of the words. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad, and Filled the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness. Ever in thy care. 
present everywhere. Thank you, Jesus. The next song is entitled In the Sweet By and By. There's a land that is favored and day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. Think of these words now. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessings that hallow our days. Sing it. In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful What a shore that's going to be and what a reunion in that's going to be. You know, some people sing that and you don't, but they do. And they look like they're not looking forward to it. Well, maybe they're not looking forward to somebody just went there that they had problems with. But you know what? At the last moment, they might have received Christ as their Savior. And you're going to run into them in heaven. So you might as well be God good to them down here. The last song we're going to sing together is The Longer I Serve Him, The Sweeter He Grows. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life He controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve Him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grace he bestows every day my way gets brighter the longer I serve him the sweeter he grows the longer I serve him the sweeter he grows the more that I love him more love he bestows each day like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Give him a hand. Praise you. You may be seated. What a savior. What a friend. Very often, we have an opportunity to meet in the presence of God. And where two or three are gathered together in his name, he says he's there. The song that I want to sing for you right now is entitled, He is Here.
can touch him, you will never be the same. How true that is and how very wise it is to touch him because we need the touch of the master's hand in our lives. Right now, my wife is going to be playing on the organ a beautiful song entitled Power in the Blood.
in the blood of the Lamb, my wife, Eleanor. Right now, Ben Thornton's going to come and read the scripture, and there are several. Uh, just listen to him as he reads it for you. Good morning, and welcome to the Bible Speak. Today's message is never give up. Sounds like me when I was coaching years ago. I tell my players, never, ever give up. And today's readings will support that. On Psalm 31, verse 24, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. From Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. From 2 Chronicles uh, 15, verse 7, But as for you, be strong and do not give up for your work will be rewarded. And from Philippians 1, verse 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Ben. Let's bow for prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, how we rejoice in you, our great God and Savior recognizing that, Lord God, as you have said to so many individuals down through the years when there's been trials and tribulations in their lives, don't quit. Help us, Lord God, to receive this very timely message. And for each one that's listening by way of YouTube or, YouTube or by the public access, and they too... Uh, feeling like quitting, help them to receive this message from you about not quitting. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It is so important for us to recognize that one of the temptations of Satan in difficult times is always to quit. I remember years uh, of being under the teaching of Dr. Stevens, who, who started the Greater Grace World Outreach, which is around the world right now. He's with the Lord, but his outreach is around the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he would say to the students time after time, don't quit, don't quit. And many are on the mission field serving God in various places because they took that word and they ran with it. We always have a temptation to quit when things get rough, but the temptation is not God's will, nor is the action of quitting God's will. The disciples thought about quitting after Jesus had been crucified, and they even did quit for a time. But Jesus came to them and renewed their faith and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, in other words, don't quit. Here are five reasons God will never give up on you. These are not what you have in your hand, nor do we have them on the screen. So listen to them carefully. The first, God put you on this journey to success. He will never give up on you. God put you on this journey to success. You see, whatever journey you're on, if you're in the will of God, it's a journey that's going to end up in success. Don't give up. Don't give up. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 1, 7, God who started you in this spiritual adventure shares with us the life of his Son and our Master Jesus. He will never give up on you, never Forget that. God isn't going to give up on you. 
You know, we, we uh, have a tendency to give up on people, but we must not because God will never give up on us, and he's our example. Never give up on people. Number two, God will give you a new way of doing things his way. God will give you a new way of doing things, and it will be his way. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. You see, God is our leader. He's the one that directs us. And therefore, it's very important for us to understand we follow into success, maybe in a new way, but we still follow into success. Don't give up. Number three, regardless of our medical condition, we're being renewed every day. Regardless of our medical condition, we are being renewed every day. And 2 Corinthians 4.16 talks about that. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. You can kill the body, you can inflict the body, but you can't kill the spirit unless you choose not to rely upon God's strength and God's wisdom and God's teachings. Then number four, when it appears that the deck is stacked against you, when nothing is going your way, never give up. Let me give that to you again. When it appears that the deck is st stacked against you, everything's going wrong in your life. When nothing is going your way, never give up. Just think, you don't need a thing. You've got it all in Jesus Christ. All God's gifts are right in front of you as you wait expectantly for the master Jesus to arrive on the scene for the finale. And not only that, God himself is right alongside to keep you steady and on the track. Follow Jesus Christ. Then number five, prayer is the absolute best thing to keep you on track. Prayer is absolutely the best thing to keep you on track. Luke 18, verse 1. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show them they should always pray and never, never, never give up. So here we have the teaching of God's word in a nutshell in five different reasons why you shouldn't give up. I want to give you four more. First, don't quit in service. Don't quit in service. That means you're serving God, never quit, no matter what happens. We, we had that experience with the jail ministry for weeks on ends, and for at least two months or more, we had nobody Every time we went there, we had nobody to minister to. Nobody came out. And then God said, after the two or three months, he said, go and get ready, and I'll send somebody. And each time, it's been three times now, God has sent every single time we went there one person. And that one person has been very unique in every way, and the gospel was given out. This last Thursday, he sent one person who had strayed away from God, and things went bad for him as he got into drugs. And then, my friends, he renewed his faith in Jesus Christ, rededicated his life, and now he's on the right track. And we're praying that he'll stay on that track. Don't quit because you don't see productivity in what you're doing for the Lord. 
do it no matter what, and God will bless it in due time if we faint not. Number two, don't quit in love. Love the lost. Don't quit in love. There are people that may have said no to you a hundred thousand times, it seems. Don't quit inviting them to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I've told you about Dr. Stevens when he went to a door month after month after month, and he was told to take a hike, get out of there. They didn't want to see him again, and before it was all said and done, because he didn't quit, they became a key part of his church, having received Christ as their Savior. What if he'd quit? They would not know the grace of God, the love of God. Don't ever quit telling people about Jesus. Number three, don't quit loving one another. You may not agree with one another. You may find somebody obstinate. You may even want to box them, but love them. Love them. Love them. Love one another. For if we love one another, then it shows we're of God and not of this world. One of the horrible things that's going, taking place in our land today is hatred. Terrible hatred in politics in particular. And it falls into other areas. It is hatred. God says don't let the Christian community take part in that. Love one another. Love the lost. Love those without Christ. The word of God says in Psalm 119, verse 130, the entrance of thy words give light. It giveth understanding to the simple. So again, the message is don't quit. Don't quit loving. Don't quit serving. Don't quit loving one another. If Columbus had turned back, no one would have blamed him because he had a lot of problems, if you know the journey. But no one would have remembered him either. If you are not a quitter, people are going to remember you. If you're a quitter, you're a, you're a part of the whole bunch that quit because people are quitting all over our land today. The margin between success and failure is often determined by one decision not to quit. The individual who quits is looking at their situation or their circumstance, but they're not looking at Jesus because Jesus never quit. He told he, the Old Testament saints, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. Everybody was quitting, but he said, don't quit. Continue, Elijah. Continue, Elisha. Continue, Moses. I could go into many of them. And he said, don't quit. Do the will I've set before you. We might be termed a failure by the world standards, but if we simply do what God tells us to do, he says we ha are successful. And we're looking for him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. How much does God expect of me, you might say? How much does he expect of you? Thankfully, God gives us an amazing promise in Isaiah 40, verse 31. Listen to those words. Those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. Those that wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Those that wait upon God, those that go through hell on earth, but they're going to follow Jesus. They're going to do what God told them to do. And they're going through hell on earth because of the, the uh, opposition to them. Don't ever quit. We're not trying to make people love us. We're trying to get people saved. We're not trying to make all kinds of friends. We're trying to 
have them escape hellfire by receiving Christ as their Savior. Don't be the person that a person turns to at the great white throne judgment, which is for unbelievers, and says, why didn't you ever tell me about Jesus? Don't be intimidated by people. Don't quit. This verse isn't just about physical weakness. It's about spiritual weakness as well. The first number on your sheets is number one, and it is emotional exhaustion can be more, even more draining than physical exhaustion. After preaching one m message with all my heart, I'm more exhausted than working all day. Emotional exhaustion can be very much more weakening and draining than anything else. When we are worn out, a good night's sleep will usually renew our strength. But emotional we weariness can utterly deplete us. What am I going to do about emotional weakness? What am I going to do about all these things that come against my heart, and my mind, and my emotions? Take them to the Lord and leave them there. You cannot deal with those things. Y it, listen, you can get mad and you can hit a pulpit or you can hit a tree and it hurts you more than it hurts anyone else. Take it to Jesus and leave it there. It's got to be dealt with. That's how the Israelites felt when the Lord spoke to them through the prophet Isaiah. He said in Isaiah 40, verse 27, these words, Why do you say, O Jacob, and assent, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my justice do me escapes the notice of God? Where is God in all of this situation I'm going through? How can I have any victory if God doesn't seem to give me victory? How can that happen? Satan isn't too keen on me giving this message. He's trying to get me by a fly. But I can tell you he won't stop it. Because you see, Satan is the lord of the flies. That's what one of his names mean. Be Beelzebub is the lord of the flies. And he's around here today, but he's going to find out he doesn't succeed. So if he attacks you next... Well, you have my permission to swat him. All right, so number two on the screen. Number two on the screen. Sometimes, and I know it's not there, but just imagine it's there. Sometimes our circumstances make us feel that the Lord has forgotten all about us. Sometimes our circumstances make us feel that the Lord has forgotten all about us. He has not forgotten us. It may seem so. Certainly Job could say that. Look at what he went through. Peter being stoned as he preaches the gospel, he could have thought that. Stephen, who was stoned to death, could have thought that, but it wasn't so. This attitude indicates we're forgetting that the suffering and hardship that we go through are part of life even for believers. God did not promise us a rose garden without thorns. There are thorns in the life of every one of us, and it's because, it's because Satan wants to hurt us and God wants to mature us. And so those thorns appear. When Adam and Eve chose to follow Satan rather than God, the consequences of sin engulf the entire world and no one is exempt. What you do affects other people. What I do affects other people. What Adam and Eve did affected all of creation. We're not in a vacuum. We can't do it and not affect somebody else. Number three, the key to victory in hardship. The very key to victory and hardship is found in responding rightly to them 
not in trying to escape them. Don't try to escape the problem. Respond the way God wants you to respond according to his word. Anyone can keep going when burdens aren't very hard. But can you keep pers persevering when burdens get so rough they almost destroy your ability to cope? Those burdens can only be met and helped and overcome by a relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ. Number four. However, this kind of radical trust is possible only when we know that God's character and understanding in his purposes is enough. In other words, I've got to get to know God. I've got to get, get to know how he purposes things by reading the word of God and see how he worked in other people's lives. He tested people all over the place in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and he gave them the ability to cope. Jesus said to, to Peter, he said, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. But after he's done that, I'm going to let him do it. Strengthen your brethren. How do you know he would come out successful? Because God would make sure he came out successful. He didn't remove the problem. He just gave him the ability to minister to his friends, acquaintances, and other disciples after the problem was dealt with. Isaiah described the Lord as an everlasting God and creator who never becomes weary, never, and whose understanding is inscrutable. You can't understand God, so don't try to. You know, you've got so much up here. It's called a brain. You've got so much up here. God has way more than that. So his ways are not our ways, nor our thoughts, his thoughts. So what are we going to do? We're going to try to tune into his ways and his thoughts. And if we do, we're going to have success. If we don't, we'll find that it doesn't work out when you go your way. It's like good old Frank Sinatra, and I did it my way. Well, that wasn't a very good way. Only God's way is a good way. So let's consider how these divine attributes of God increase your trust in him as you go through troubles. Note number five. Because he's your creator, he made plans for your life. Your life is not willy-nilly. God made plans for each of our lives. According to the word of God, before I was formed in my mother's belly, God had a plan for me. Think of all the aborted children God has a plan for, and they're aborted, and it's just because I just don't want the problem, or I don't want the situation. And if the baby, if the baby in our culture survives abortion, we kill it anyways if the mother says, I want you to. We're going to have to answer as a nation for letting that happen. And certainly those that call upon it, unless they repent of their sin, are going to have to answer eternally for aborting a child. Why? Because God has a plan for every single child that's born. Every single child. When God put Billy Graham in his mother's womb, he had a plan for Billy Graham. When God put you in your mother's womb, he had a plan for your life. Are we fulfilling that plan? Only you and God knows that because God's plan is very clear. So because he's your creator, he made plans for your life, and they are being carefully worked out through each circumstance you encounter. Everything I encounter is another opportunity to work out something God has put within me and make me a stronger person of faith. 
Furthermore, he never loses track of you. If you think God, well, he's lost track of you. I wonder where you are now. <laughs> I lose track of people, but God doesn't lose track of people because you're always, according to the word of God, on his mind. Think about that. I am always on the mind of God. Can you be depressed when you think that way? Can you be depressed as an individual in the kingdom of God when you know that you're always on the mind of God and he has good thoughts toward you and he loves you with an everlasting love? Can you really be depressed over that? If you can, there's something wrong with that brain and we need it fixed. And finally, he's omniscient which means his reasons for allowing trials in your life may be beyond your comprehension or my comprehension, but they're always right and mean something that is good for my benefit. Whatever God puts me through, it is to make me a better Christian, a more solid Christian, a person of faith, that I have never been before. It is planning my last days as the best days in my life because God has that plan for your life. In the same chapter, Isaiah describes the Lord as a shepherd who tends, gathers, and gently leads his sheep. Think about that. He's the good shepherd. There are many bad shepherds in the world today. And some of them are in the churches as pastors. They are hirelings. They're just hired. And when things get bad, they just find somewhere else to go. But a true pastor, a true shepherd, doesn't go anywhere that God doesn't send them and doesn't move anywhere that God hasn't directed them to move. In other words, they protect the sheep no matter what. Even if there's one sheep and that sheep keeps getting into trouble, that shepherd will stay there for that one sheep. Jesus went and won the lost sheep of Israel one by one by one by one. He went to Zacchaeus' house, a notorious tax collector, and he went there to redeem Zacchaeus from his lost condition. One person was important and that my friends means that as you serve God it doesn't matter whether you have two three four five people or a hundred people or a thousand people serve them with all of your heart minister to them because God has put you in their lives to minister to them and they are important to God here we see the greatness of God's love and his mercy his mercy is, you don't get what you deserve. And I thank God, I have never got what I deserved. I deserve God's abandoning me. I deserve God's judging me. I'm a sinner, but God saved me. He gave me mercy, and he called me to be a pastor, and he did these things because of mercy, not because of merit. I didn't deserve it. God did it, and he did that in your life in different ways as well. Number six, he cares and provides for our needs. He cares and provides for our needs. <coughs> he carries us when we're too weak to walk and gently leads us and guides us when we don't know where to go. <coughs> Let me read that again. He cares and provides for our needs. Have you never had your needs supplied? All of us have had our needs supplied. God supplies our needs, and to this very day, there's not a person in this audience that God has not supplied their needs. Not all our wants, but our needs. When we're too weak to walk, he's our crutch. Think about that. 
I can't even walk without him holding my hand. I can't live the Christian life without God giving me the capacity to. I cannot minister the unconditional word of God without God giving me the anointing to. He gently guides us when we just don't know where to go. And you know how he does that? He says, stand still. Stand still until I direct you. Don't be so anxious to move before I direct you. The disciples had lost Judas. He had betrayed the Lord. He had denied the Lord. He, he had done everything because he had never received the Lord as his Savior, and they were anxious to create another disciple. So they cast their dies and dice, and that's the way many people did it in that day. I don't know how good it is, but that's what they did. They shook their dice, and they chose a man by the name of Mattathias to be the 12th disciple, replacing Judas. But the word of God indicates that God chose Paul. God chose Paul. They were too anxious to move before God gave them direction. Don't be too anxious to do anything without knowing it's God's direction. Then do whatever God directs you to do with all of your heart. God told Abraham to offer Isaac. I'm sure he questioned God for a moment, and when he knew it was God that was telling him to do this, he did it without question. He did it without question. Whatever God directs you to do, Wait for him to direct you and then do it without question. And then it says, he gently guides us when we don't know where to go. All these qualities should motivate us to trust God. He's our shepherd. He's our lover. He's omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is all that we need. We sing, Jesus is all I need. But sometimes we act as if we need something besides Jesus. We don't need anything besides Jesus. If you've ever been tempted to give up or complain to the Lord, perhaps you don't understand how much he wants to help you, how much he loves you. Isaiah 40, verse 29 says, He gives strength to the weary. You are weary? Go to God. God will give you strength. He goes on to say, And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Whatever I lack, God says, He'll give it to me. But I must ask to receive. Ask and you shall receive, that your joy might be full. But if I don't ask and I lack something, then how can I receive? I receive only if I ask God according to his will, and then God blesses me. Number seven, God never intends that we live out of our own strength. God never intends that we live out of our own strength. I have only so much strength. I've matured in Christ only so far. And when I say I have matured all the way, I'm foolish. I need to mature every day of my life in Christ. And therefore, I have a limited amount of strength because I've walked with him a while. But I may have a problem that that strength is not enough. And I have to go to him and I say, God, I don't have enough strength to trust you in this situation. I don't have enough strength to cast my cares upon you and know you'll answer them. Give me that strength. And it is God's good pleasure to give me such strength. It is God's good pleasure. Whether you're in need of physical or emotional might, he can replenish you with his divine provision of strength. 
since God has all the power we could possibly need, and he does have all the power, he's a great and big and mighty God, and we desire it, and therefore all we have to do is harness it. Call upon me, and I will give you great and marvelous things. Isaiah tells us that the key is to wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Are we willing to wait for God? Are we willing to wait for God for this provision, for that provision, for this situation, for that situation? Are we willing to let God take his time, or must it be now? We are now people. We like God to do things now. Don't pull it off. I need it by tonight. And you know what? God often waits until the night's over so that you're holding with your the tips of your hand on a cliff, so to speak, and you're getting ready to let go. And God says to you, let go, let go. Are you crazy, God? You're telling me to let go. I'll fall into that pitch darkness. And God says, trust me. And I let go. And it's only five inches to the bottom. But I had to trust him. I had to trust him because I didn't know it was five inches to the bottom of that cave or that, that cliff. I didn't know that. I had to trust him. What did Abraham say to the, the individuals that were with him as he took Isaac to that mountain to kill him? He said, my son and I are going to the mountain to worship And we will come back. We will come back. He knew that even if he had to kill his own son as God told him to, God would resurrect his son and the both of them would come back. That's deep faith. That's real faith. That isn't childish faith. That's mature faith. And God's trying to reach us and bring us to that point because we're not always there. He wants to give us an abundant maturity in Christ. But he has to stretch us and stretch us and stretch us. That's uh, probably the last thing we want to wait for the Lord when we're burdened and overwhelmed. But God says to do that. We want relief. We don't want delays. We want relief. However, waiting for the Lord is not the same as waiting for the end of a difficult season in our life. Note number eight. The Hebrew word translated wait carries with it the idea of hope and expectation. Hope and expectation. I am waiting on the Lord with hope and expectation. I know God is going to come through for me in some way. He's going to do something greater than I could even imagine. A soul gets saved. That's God doing something greater than I could even imagine. As one experience we had very recently in the jail ministry, a guy came in and he wanted to get saved right then and there. He didn't want the Bible study until afterwards. He wanted to get saved. I didn't expect that. Usually, you give them the Bible study, and they get convicted, and they want to get saved if they want to get saved. But this guy came, and he did understand salvation, and he did want to get saved. Somebody had worked on his life in the past. They had given him the right seed. They had watered him. And now he was ready to receive the Lord, and we had the privilege of harvesting that soul. Are we as anxious for God to work in our lives in tremendous ways as that man was anxious to get saved in that jail cell? We, be, we should be so anxious for God 
to work in our lives that we say every morning, please do a work through me today. Please minister your love through me today. Please lead someone to Christ through my witness today. Please use me in a special way today. I want to make my life count for the kingdom. Instead of, oh, another day, another miserable day, another day I wish I wasn't alive, another day when i, I got to do this or I've got to do, that is miserable. I want to wake up and say, God, I don't know what you can do with my life today, but I want you to do something for your kingdom in my life today. I want somebody to know that you love them. I want somebody to know that you died for them on the cross and that they can have eternal life through receiving you as their Savior. I want somebody to say, I'm so glad that you came into my life today. And they eventually, if not right then, receive Christ as their Savior. Since we don't automatically know what to expect from God or how he's going to work in our life in one single day, we need to spend time with him. Spend time with your God. We need to not only spend time, we need to share how we feel with him. Be honest with him. He already knows. Be honest with him. If, he, if you think he's giving you a raw deal, tell him so. Read the Psalms. David did that. It's all right. God is not going to cast you into hell because you're honest with him. He already knows it. So talk with him. Tell him how you feel. And turn your attention to the word of God that he may speak back to you. For he uses the word of God to speak back to us. And also prayer, of course, but he uses the word of God. Not just prayer, but the word of God. Then we should quietly listen in anticipation to what God is saying to us. What are you saying to me, God? Make it plain. Remember, when he spoke to the world, he spoke in parables. And when he spoke to his disciples after the parable, and they said, tell us what you meant. He opened up the word of God to them and told them what the parable meant. The word of God is for believers. And anyone who receives Christ as their Savior then has an open Bible. Because the Holy Spirit comes to live within them and starts teaching them the word of God. But if they don't open up that door by receiving Christ, they never do understand the word of God, the Bible. They can't understand it. It's spiritually discerned. But when I come to God and I say, explain this word to me, what I've just read, explain it. God will do that. God will do that. And it's good for people to get together and share what God has said to them so that they too can get blessed by it. Number nine, as we rely on his promises, our anxiety will be replaced with his peace. As we rely on his promises, our anxiety will be replaced by his peace. Think of it. All of us have anxious spirits. You can't be in this world and not have an anxious spirit. But if you go to God and cast all your cares upon him and ask him to minister his grace to you, his peace to you, you've got to get his peace because God will honor that kind of request. God wants to give you a peace that passes all understanding. You're going through hell, but nobody knows it because you're so happy. And God gave you that joy. You didn't get joy from the problem. You got joy from Jesus. 
That's the difference. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It wasn't because you're happy about the situation or the problem or the anxiety. It's because Jesus is all you need. And when you come to him, he gives you a peace in the midst of your storm. I've seen it work in my own life. And I've seen it work in other people's lives. And when it works in your life and someone else's life, you know it's God. It's God. This ministry is perhaps one of the most difficult ministries that I have ever experienced. And I've experienced some difficult ministries, but there's so few. But you know what? God still anoints to the same capacity if there was 10,000 here. God still speaks. God still strengthens me. God still anoints me. God still gives me hope. God still gives me strength to go on. And that's because my God has promised to supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Do I have a moment of despair? Oh, yes. But that's a moment. It's a passing, fleeting moment. Lord of the flies has taken off. I haven't felt him for a while. He doesn't like what we're saying. You know, flies are around dead things. He found out we weren't dead. He found out we weren't dead. And I don't know where he's gone, but I hope he stays there. He is corrupt and he's wicked. The Lord never promised to shield us from challenges, but we can be confident that if we have to run, he'll strengthen us as we go. He'll strengthen us as we go. And if our journey is long, he'll help us through it with his hand in our hand. Number 10. When we wait upon him, believing he is able and willing to come to our aid. Anything is possible. Let me read it again. When we wait upon him, him, God, believing that he is able and willing to come to our aid, anytime he wants to, he will come to our aid. He is able and willing. Anything is possible. All things are possible with God. Nothing is possible without God. I'm waiting on God for the next election because I am not waiting on political parties. I'm waiting on God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God will select the power he wants in there for whatever purpose God wants it. Some people will become crazy. No matter who wins, they'll become crazy. But God can give us the peace that passes all understanding, and it could just end up in a rapture earlier than we suspected. But all I can say is this. My God is able to supply all our needs all we need, God is able to supply. And there is nothing emotional that I need that God cannot supply. Nothing financially I need that God cannot supply. There is nothing in love that I need that God can't give me. There is nothing in loneliness that I may have that God can't give me his presence. Everything is of God, and God is everything. Let's pray. Father, all I can say is there's no quitters here today. The only one that has quit is Satan, and he quit bugging us. And he is a quitter. He is a miserable quitter. But God's people don't have to be like Satan. They can be people of integrity that followed Jesus and served Jesus 
with all of their hearts and never quit serving Jesus until they hear, come up here. And we recognize our rewards come next. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been, you've been successful in a few things, faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you rule over many things. Oh, that's because we didn't quit. We served God to the end, and we have a crown of glory to lay at the feet of Jesus. Father, if there's anyone listening to us on television that has never received Christ as their Savior, oh, my friends, quit running away from God. In your case, quit running away from God. Quit thinking you can do it on your own. Quit living a life that you think maybe God's going to take you into his heaven because you're a good person. Quit that nonsense. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. You must be born again, Jesus said to Nicodemus, a religious man. You cannot enter the kingdom of God without receiving Jesus as your Savior. Won't you do that right now? God so loved you that he gave his only son, Jesus, that if you would believe on him as your Savior and receive him into your life, you would not end up in hell in an eternity of suffering. Won't you receive Jesus? He loves you. He's there for you. He's knocking at your heart door. If you will, say this prayer to God. Dear God, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for my sins. Thank you. Jesus, come into my life right now and be my Lord and my Savior. Help me to live for you, to go to church, and to follow you through your word. And I pray this in your wonderful, holy name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you will turn with me in your hymnals to hymn number 602, I have decided to follow Jesus. 602. Let's stand as we sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided.
I'm so glad that those watching by way of television have tuned in today if we can help you in any way. If you receive Christ as your Savior, please write us, let us know. Write to the Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire, zip code 03246. That's the Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire, zip code 03246. If you would like to receive a notification of our services and the times, please write us and let us know that as well. We would love to have you visit us at The Bible Speaks. If you're in the area, we'd love to have you come. And if you're listening by way of television, but you're going to be in New Hampshire at any one point, we invite you to come and visit us for our morning worship service at quarter to 11. There are other services at 7 in the evening and on Wednesday at 7 in the evening. God bless you. Have a great week. You're right to us. Lakeport. Zip code. Four six. That's the box. Street. But New Hampshire. Oh three two. Six. Services every Lord. Sunday school at nine. And the morning service is at quarter to If you cannot make it, then please watch us.